good afternoon all good evening some good morning some we have a, a substantial audience from around the world uh, so welcome to you all um, i'm clive snell i'm the md of contact live and i'm delighted to welcome you to this amnet round table reimagining pub reimagining publishing content production simplified Together, Amnet and Contact have assembled a fabulous panel to discuss this topic, and my job now is to introduce them. Firstly, Gayathri Doraswamy, who is Amnet's Senior Vice President, Technology and Digital Transformation. And Gayathri will lead and facilitate today's discussion for us. Our panelists, Ian Mulvaney, he's the CTO at the BMJ, Christian Cole, consultant, Adam Hyde, who's the founder of Coco, and Helen King, head of transformation at Sage Publishing. Just a couple of housekeeping things. We're using Zoom webinar, your mics are muted, but we do want questions from uh, our audience. So please do post them in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the screen, and we will pick those up and get to them uh, near the end of the meeting. Gayathri is going to do a little scene setting uh, for a few minutes, uh, then we're going to move to the panel discussion. There will be poll questions through the panel, so uh, please uh, participate in those. We're going to run for one hour, um, and uh, that's all I need uh, to say. I'll be back nearer the end to, to help out with the Q&A. All I need to do now is thank everyone for coming, hand over to Gayathri. Thank you, Clive. Good evening, everyone. Greetings to all. I hope you and your family are doing safe. Amnet is quite proud to be partnering with Contact Live for this virtual roundtable. A very warm welcome to the distinguished panelists, industry experts, and to the wonderful audience here. A quick intro about Amnet and the Energy Group. Energy Group of Companies is a multinational business group that offers an extensive range of state-of-the-art services in content, data, and design. We are pioneers in smart sharing. Amnet, Amnet specializes in the content space. We are Amnet is a global creative production studio. It works alongside brands and agencies delivering unmatched creative production services across the globe. Fresho One is a creative agency. It works on integrated marketing solution. Springboard is our data arm. It focuses on data acquisition services and processing solutions in the data management space. Books is our self-publishing platform. It's an end-to-end self-publishing powered by technology. Sol Studios, based out of New York, it's our high-end boutique services in creative production. At Energy, we are quite proud to be associated with the Energy Project. It's a non-profit dedicated to funding passion. About Amnet, Amnet is a tech-enabled services company with over 20 years of experience serving publishers. Amnet provides technology-led end-to-end solutions. It's currently embarking on a mission to a digital transformation, and Amnet is focused on building digital-first platform capabilities, building unified content frameworks for the journal and the books publishing, delivering products and services that transforms the production product space through data-led innovation, browser-based solution, and adoption of key digital accelerators. Without much ado, we can move to the of the day. I welcome the panelists into the discussion. You know, let's get to our discussion, reimagining publishing content production simplified. As we all know, publishers are striving to push beyond the current barriers of the legacy processes. Of course, the intent is to produce in instant pages. This rapid expansion of the digital media has given immense opportunities for us to focus on reducing costs and to streamline publishing processes and operations. We all know that the traditional workflows and processes are quite limiting in this context as they lack immediacy, the outputs are rigid, they are static, and also lack interactivity. And more and more we see publishers are looking to move away from the legacy processes and trying to embrace a true digital experience with the advancements of the browsers. While we are focusing on efficiencies through workflow requirements and standardization of the requirements, you know, optimization, very little innovation has taken place in this space towards content orchestration, production, content production, and content dissemination. Let's join our panelists to hear their thoughts on the subject. 
audience will be given the opportunity to post the question at the end of the session. And you can use the Q&A option on your Zoom control to post the question. Let's move to the first question of the day. Diane, would you like to take the first question? Sure. How is publishing landscape, you know, today evolving with the technology evolution and, and what does digital transformation means in the context of today's world? So I think, um, I think that I'm, I'm going to focus on that term digital transformation. Um, it's come up a lot in the last few weeks, at BMJ. It's a very broad term. It's quite unspecific. People can pin a lot onto it and it's a bit amorphous. So it's one of those terms that because of its ambiguity, people sometimes find common ground with it, but also can find feel a bit woolly. For me, it's about using digital to support what we do for our customers, uh, what we do for the mission of the organization. And I like to unpack it a little bit and think about that in terms of the very specific either capabilities that we need in an organization or the blockers that might exist in an organization to help us overcome some of our challenges. And I think it has to be put in the framework of the strategy of an organization. And so what we're seeing with how publishers are considering their position in markets is we are trying to get smarter about understanding who our customers are, what our co content means and is about, and how we can match those better to transform some of the business models that we have. And so the digital transformation component is asking questions around what are the processes, knowledge, metadata, tools, technologies, or, or data layers that we have inside of our organization that are either enabling that transformation of the business models or hindering them and therefore need uh, solutions to address that to help us move forward. That, that's kind of my view. And the more specific you can get, the more actionable it becomes and the more you can pin KPIs against it and determine whether you're making real progress. Thank you. Thank you, wonderful thoughts. Adam, would you like to add your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I find this um, notion of digital transformation a bit, um, I find a bit bewildering. I mean, it's like asking what digital transformation will do for you in a publishing industry where, you know, all the content is already digital is kind of like going to a factory and saying, so what are you going to do with mechanical transformation? You know, it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, that is the industry. The industry is digital. The big transformation happened with the migration from paper. So I think, um, you know, I agree with Ian, we sort of need to define what we're talking about and refine it and scope it. And so I would say that the thing that's most interesting is um, we, we tend to conflate, I think or we use this as a way of actually saying, the, in my mind, the web. <laughs> How is the web transforming publishing? And we haven't, I don't think the publishing industry is fully engaged in it. Um, the publishing industry is using it as a distribution mechanism and, and still sort of lives in this kind of um, post paper digital paradigm where we have this an, uh, analog between um, paper manuscripts and digital manuscripts. And we need to migrate out of that um, into a web paradigm. And, and then that's quite a different scenario. And it's not just about distribution, it's about collaboration and concurrency. And then the question becomes, how are you using those things to transform what you're doing and where can it lead you? So I think that for me, that's more the question. And I, I don't have an answer because I think there's a lot you could do, <laughs> uh, but I'm seeing, I've seen over the year that the, the movement in this direction has been quite slow. Um, it's not to say it doesn't exist, not to say that publishers don't have a motivation to uh, go in these kind of directions, but um, we've not sort of seen the kind of inverted commas transformation that we expected um, many years ago. Yeah, you rightly said that there are, uh, it, it's happening in different waves. And I think we are certainly embracing the next wave of transformation, you know, and the opportunities are really immense. Helen, would you like to add your thoughts? Yeah, sure. I mean, I very much agree with what, what Ian and Adam have said. For me, digital transformation happened over 20 years ago for most publishers, and, and not a lot has happened since. Those websites don't look all that different than they did 20 years ago. And I think for me, as it's really putting our users at the heart of what we're doing. The, the, the academic community is, is not where it was 20 years ago. They've moved on, we haven't moved on as publishers. And I think it's really finding ways to engage with that community and meet their needs and really think about 
as as um, Adam said, how do we how do we really make the best use of the web rather than just being digital? How do we make the use of the web as a as a medium? Absolutely, Christian, your thoughts, please. Yeah, it's uh, quite difficult to add uh, <laughs> any more insights after the three of you, but. Um, I think, I mean, digital transformation is, is never finished, really. I mean, it, it will always be an ongoing process because there will always be new digital technologies that you could potentially apply to, I don't know, your business processes or your culture or um, your business models. Um, so, but, but in, in general, I agree with what you've said is that um, there was a big push uh, a couple of years ago although there are still some publishers uh, <laughs> that haven't made even this jump. So it's, it's not like everybody's on the same level here. And, um, th but the next step is really, I think, to um, understand what users and customers, which are not always the same people, depending on which segment of the publishing industry you're looking at, um, right. really need or really want, which are also two different things maybe. And then, try to find out like how you can like change your processes and, and use technology to meet these needs and make money while doing it. Uh, I think, I mean, that's the gist of digital transformation and especially looking at publishing. Um, I think what, what has long been ignored is um, how are reading habits, for example, evolving and changing over time, right? And, and like, do we maybe need to... Um, change our conceptual models that we're using in our ERP systems, in our business models. The, the containers we're selling are maybe not the containers people want anymore, or maybe they want different containers in parallel to the ones we're currently selling. So I think that's that's really the, uh, the big change um, that needs to first happen uh, in, in the companies, in, in, in the heads of people, um, the technology, I mean, it's, it's work that needs to be done, but it's not the problem anymore. I think it's more um, a conceptual issue. Absolutely. I think Adam also nailed the point of the digital transformation has happened, you know, and Helen added that the last 20 years, you know, publishers have embraced digital, uh, you know, embraced the technologies at that point in time and XML was a big wave uh, 10 years ago. Looking at the opportunities that are before us, quick question to you, Adam. Uh, what, what are the opportunities that are before us? How could we look at simplifying the content production, leveraging the advancements of the browser today? And right from, I mean, not specifically one aspect, but the entire landscape is before us, right from acquisition to dissemination of the content. Is there a common theme as what we could focus as HTML and, and what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I think I think the the real thing that we still need to sort of unrealized dream that we still can drive towards is um, is single source publishing. Um, you know, the notion that we have um, a shared source format um, across the entire workflow, and you know, XML sort of offered that promise, but actually, XML, you know, much like Arabic is a family of languages, XML is a family of sort of file types and we say you know xml single source we actually just mean xml is in there and it's used in in a multiple master kind of way so you know um, the master resides with the author in microsoft word the designer perhaps in indesign and internally at some other sort of um uh, bespoke xml format and there's all these conversions between all these things and the workflow gets broken and so i think when you talk about simplifying things you know you have to talk about simplifying that um, and bringing it all together, focusing on a single um, shared source. Um, and once you do that, then all sorts of other things um, come possible because um, in my mind, um, the, the web is the be best mechanism for realizing these kinds of workflows. Um, you know, that it's a distributed um, surface area that everybody can engage with across a team. And you have to start thinking, we have to start thinking about the entire production workflow as being a team-based event, uh, which is collaborative and concurrent, importantly. So driving towards concurrency is where um, the, the real big uh, gains can be made in publishing, in, in my opinion. Quite interesting, uh, Adam. 
So if, if, if I understand what you said just now, just to embrace HTML as a medium right from the start uh, and, and lead the entire process through and through and, and look at uh, XML as, as a last mile delivery, perhaps. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's a religion, isn't it? It's, uh, it, um, you it know, is. file formats, <laughs> but I would advocate HTML, yeah. It, it is indeed, indeed. And, and it also gives you an opportunity to um, have all these stakeholders on the same page and, and working on the same content, not being able to worry about the file formats or not being able to worry about uh, different versions of the files, you know, and authors and editors can just simply focus on the content and add value to the content uh, instead of just click, you know, um, switching between multiple uh, windows. Ian, what are your thoughts on that? Um, the, if we think about just a browser, I think browser is an incredibly powerful platform and it's a platform that people have common access to. So you can enhance the capabilities in the browser. I think the question of, um, things that the publishing ecosystem should focus on re reducing that time between the submitted artifact and the published artifact is, is, is where the value is. And, and, and the comments Adam was making are really pertinent to, how it can be a focus for bringing people together. But at the same time, that's hard. So we use Google Docs a lot in, in BMJ and, and, and I'm constantly looking for file versions and folders and so forth. So it doesn't, it doesn't take away that problem, but it does enable a platform where you can start to address it. And I wonder as well, as the browser becomes more capable, but there, there are other things that can run in the browser that can enhance the process. Uh, so I, I noticed recently there was a startup uh, that just got funding, which allows a single line JavaScript that you can drop into any application to give it exact like features or functionality. So maybe the cost of experimenting with these kinds of experiences comes down by focusing on the browser as that platform. But we have a long way to go, I would say. And the browser in and of itself gives those opportunities, but a deep thinking about the nature of those workflows will be required. Absolutely. Absolutely. Christian, do you uh, have any thoughts on that in terms of what opportunities are there in terms of focusing on workflows to enable such a, uh, embracing such a workflow? Yeah, I mean, basically confirming, especially concurrency. I, I mean, that's really, I've done a lot of business process modeling and optimization things for various clients over the last, I don't know, five, six years. And if, if you then analyze these processes and leave out the technology, um, even, even like from a, purely conceptual point of view, it's like things have to happen sequentially because that's the way it's always been done. And, and if you then, and at the same time, we all want to be faster. Our authors want us to be far, faster. And um, sometimes it's as simple as having certain steps happen in parallel. And then you think about how can we make this happen in a way that's seamless and, and easy to use and so on and so forth. And then uh, you often end up with uh, browser-based solutions. Um, and um, I mean, the, the, the benefits uh, are quite clear, even if you um, just focus on, on cost uh, reduction and stuff like that, because I mean, there's open standards, there's standards that are being developed by parties around the world and, and so on and so forth. So you can actually maybe even reduce your own um, uh, CapEx, um, investment uh, and, and benefit from what others are doing. So it's there's a lot of potential there, I think. And uh, to be fair, some publishers uh, have already embraced it. Some are in the process of embracing it um, and, and others will lag behind. I mean, that's always been the case. So it's, uh, it's not like nobody's taking it up. It's just uh, slow moving as our industry has probably always been. Absolutely. And, and uh, the opportunities are before us, and we all know that that yeah, the industry is warming to browser-based applications and browser-based systems now. Are there the overarching principles that, as an ecosystem, you know, the entire ecosystem should focus on before we start embarking on uh, this journey individually? You know, as publishers, each one of them are approaching this individually. Are there overarching prin principles that the entire ecosystem should look at uh, that supports innovation? Helen, would you like to share your thoughts on that? I think that's a I think it's a really tricky question to answer. The, the obvious thing is, well, we need more standards and we need to be interoperable. But with that brings a huge overhead that 
tends to stifle innovation. I'm, I don't have a I don't have a brilliant answer to this one. I think we'll move faster if we all do our own thing and run lots of experiments and find out what works. But as a whole community, if we all do that, then when we'll limit each other because my my thing I've developed won't be able to talk to your thing that you've developed. So I don't have a good answer, I'm afraid. I wish I did, but I would like to see us all be able to use the same standards and systems to build on each other's work. But at the same time, I don't want to be held back by that and have to wait a year before I can develop that for that standard to be developed. So yeah, tricky one for me to answer there, I think. Leanne, would you like to just add your points? I think we're in a very difficult position as an industry because we have significant fragmentation in terms of just the number of publishers. It's, it's, a, it's an industry that scales by having individual journals that grow out. And many other industries have started to create scale by having one player that's come in and dominated by creating a platform with some reasonable amount of space to level the playing field and allow new people to come in and operate on top of that platform. And we don't have that in our, in our space and in our industry. So, so I've seen so many startups come in and want to be that new complete platform. And when I worked at Mendeley, that was a lot of our, our narrative. We were going to be this plan, platform of transformation in the industry. And it never really happens because of that fragmentation. So it's a really difficult one to crack. Uh, I suspect that just like doubling down on clear licensing, things like CC BY, having, I, I know a lot of the focus on this discussion is around moving, uh, the opportunities of moving away from XML, but that XML at least is a family of languages of some similarity, it, it can be helpful. So I, I don't know, yeah, so it's a bit of a half answer there. I think it's hard. I understand, I understand. I don't know if, if XML is our religion and typesetting has really got, and I'm <laughs> sure that there were some unspoken and unspoken rules and, and, and standards that have evolved and all of us uh, carry forward like, uh, you know, um, you know, religiously we, we try to uh, honor these uh, uh, requirements. Uh, so my, my question uh, about the overarching principle is also as a community, should we look at uh, uh, these nuances that we had agreed upon uh, a while ago and are these intact uh, in today's context? And, and should we get together as a community and come out, look at uh, overarching principles um, that we should focus on that actually enables um, innovation? The browsers have not been fully evolved in terms of uh, catering to all the uh, pagination nuances, what we see within InDesign. Um, is, is there a need to do that? And, and that's the question that, uh, uh, that I have in my mind. Adam, would you like to uh, chime in there? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot there to respond to. I'd say, like, um, you know, I think innovation doesn't happen if, it, uh, you know, if, um, if we if we wanted one player to transform everything, you know, uh, uh, the whole world would be using Microsoft, you know, uh, or whatever, right? So I, I think we need this sort of distributed innovation that pops up and um, finds its own way. I mean, it's what innovation is, right? It's a response, <laughs> um, and and it's kind of has to be an outsider response because it's paradigm breaking, right? And um, and you know, like a lot of what the big Silicon Valley companies do these days, if they want innovation, they actually set up a startup outside of their organization, you know, to, to sort of have this kind of attack. <laughs> um, and then they they break down their processes and improve them. And I, I think that's what we need. I mean, we need that kind of mechanism. I, I don't believe in this kind of like one, even though I'm from New Zealand, this one ring to rule them all <laughs> scenario, right? I, I mean, I think um, of course, if this the uh, whole publishing industry use cocoa products, I think it would be a beautiful universe, but um, you know, that's not the point. The point is this proliferation of experiments and, and, and things like standards and stuff evolve on the way. And I don't think you can force a standards first approach. It doesn't work. Standards development process has to be organic and it has to evolve out of a need and it has to evolve from the fact that a lot of people are frustrated by trying to do something and it just, they're all like um, at cross um, purposes to each other, but trying to achieve the same thing. And that's where standards come from. And standards processes are long and laborious and, you know, so, 
you know, that's how it works, right? And I, I don't think we can sort of like try and pretend otherwise. We can't sort of try and have this harmonized, centralized infrastructure. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. We have to have this proliferation. So you know, in that, there are a lot of things that I think that are important to have as sort of groupings. And one of them is, of course, in, in my opinion, and no surprise to anyone that knows what COCO does, is I think we need to maybe migrate towards um, uh, uh, a kind of a shared code basis for innovation, um, where we can have sort of baseline starting points and that we work around those. So for example, working around, um, uh, we, this is not an advertisement, but we have a product called uh, PageJS, which does um, pagination uh, from HTML and makes beautiful books and beautiful journal articles, um, you know, from CSS and HTML. You know, working, bringing people together to work around this where everyone has a shared interest and that they can evolve those products together. Um, and that requires, in my opinion, open source and enlightened um, um, self-interest. Um, that's that's kind of the space that we need to be right not in the sort of monolithic space not in just a wreck bag whole lot of a whole lot of little things but a sort of like a commitment to um work together where it makes sense and really get in there um and i i think sometimes the publishing industry i mean if you look at publishing publishers everyone's invented the wheel you know every publisher has reinvented the publishing wheel you know over and over again and they don't talk to each other they don't share the sort of learnings and uh, and i think that's also really holding us back um so yeah i think i think more conversations and more of a commitment to work on things and differentiate ourselves not on uh, technology but share the burden of developing these technologies to move us all forward and then work out other ways to differentiate whether it's you know publishing domain or services or whatever yeah, more conversations and more collaboration amongst the community. On that note, let's do an audience poll question. On your screen, uh, attendees, you will see a poll question. You can choose to agree or disagree. Just uh, continuing from uh, the previous point, Adam, uh, uh, about embracing HTML as a medium, and you talked about beautiful pages being produced and, and HTML offering that possibility. And, and do you see content production and dissemination, the entire uh, chain of production, right? From uh, you know assimilation of the content, right? At acquisition to content dissemination. Uh, we know that in pockets it's happening. Do, do you see that this being the future is the future of publishing HTML? Yeah, I think in, in, inevitably, yes. Um, I think XML had 25 years of a, of a uh, I would classify stranglehold. <laughs> uh, and I mean that, you know, like psychologically, right? You know, the, the, the whole term XML first is like, is like playing a trump card in a technical conversation, right? And nobody can say, that XML first is a dumb idea because XML first as a statement is a kind of default good is how it's seen, right? And I, and I think we need to move move away from that. Um, it, we are moving away from that. I think we're seeing more acceptance of HTML. Uh, and I believe that is the future. And I think inevitably it's going to be the future for publishing because, you know, let's face it, um, the world's content and knowledge is stored in HTML. It just is even in the sector. Um, and um, so, you know, it's, it's like this, it's just like the tide, you know, it, it, no matter how much you fight against it, it's gonna come in. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it, it, I, I firmly believe just, it might take 30 years, 50 years, I don't know, but um, who knows, uh, but I think HTML is gonna be the future of publishing. And it, it already is to a degree, right? It's part of it, there's no publisher out there that doesn't have HTML as part of their ecosystem. Um, but um, it, it needs to move, it, that needs to be recognized and moved into the center and, and um, become a large part of the organization's um, uh, workflows uh, instead of, I think there has been for a long time, a consideration by the publishing industry that XML is for experts and people are serious about documents. And then there's the, 
you know, the wilderness of, of folks. It's, it's less of these days, but, you know, that is sort of the web, you know, and, and there's a differentiation between these two things. And I think it's, it's a problem. It's, it's holding, that sort of, this sort of thinking is really holding uh, us back. Yes, of course. Um, uh, yes, Ian, please go on. I think one of the things here is that the tool set around XML introduces significant cognitive load and the numbers of people who are expert on working with it is a much smaller population. From my own perspective, you know, there's this discussion around what's the true format and what format people consume things in. It should be PDF or HTML or XML. I don't really care. I think, uh, I, I think we should be presenting the content to people in a way that they like. And the browser enables presenting PDF-like objects. So we don't really have to worry about the distinction between PDF and HTML. But underlying this trend, the question I would ask is, which path reduces that cognitive load in our systems for how we can develop them. Um, I'm still a huge fan of XML now, though 10 years ago I hated it because that's where the, the balance of our current structured metadata resides. And so there's a cost of transition away from that. So, but in my own systems, whether that is stored in an S3 bucket, the, whether the metadata is stored in an elastic search, whether it's stored in a MarkLogic database, the thing that really matters is how that is exposed up to where we're creating value. And I think at that layer, HTML reduces a lot of those loads, those cognitive loads, those intrinsic and implicit cognitive loads, and also opens the door to the skill set of a much larger population of people who can work with it. But you do lose things if you just go for plain HTML. So thinking about how we have semantic HTML or HTML with good structure is an important consideration. Absolutely. Two so contrast thoughts and very beautiful thoughts. Yes, Christian. Yeah, just to add quickly, terminology wise, I mean, HTML is XML, right? Um, which is when we say XML, we mean bespoke XML. Just, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the idea is to see whether we could just move from XML being the format of working to, to XML as a last mile delivery where the entire ecosystem of browsers have uh, given us too much of possibilities and the possibilities of collaboration amongst all the stakeholders. People need not worry really about uh, what happens behind the scenes, whether it is an InDesign environment or whether it is a Word environment. And, and, and that's the possibility that's before us. Of course, there are challenges that are associated with that. But before we move on, Helen, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I think it's definitely going to be the future. And I think it's a really exciting future. And I think that what we do now, what we inflict on authors with our current systems is painful. And an author going in, being able to either take their manuscript for another system or upload it if they're using a, you know, Word or something, be able to see it on the screen, be able to edit it and just check. And there being a process that says you've got figure three missing do you want to just put figure three in before you submit and all of those checks should just be there and we make it as easy and quick and possible for our users as as as, as we can the thought that well you submit your manuscript and then another week later someone comes back and says oh well you didn't put figure three in so we can't process it then you do that and then oh no but you didn't do this so you know you've got to make another change and please resubmit before we can move it forward all of, all of that can go if we have these uh, HTML workflows, and I, I think it's a really exciting, exciting future. That's a very familiar problem, Helen. All right. On that note, let's add uh, an audience poll, please. The audience poll is the future of publishing HTML. Well, the audience is answering to that. Let's also move to the next part, which is another interesting contrast. In the workflows that we have today, the dichotomy of the web and the print output deliveries are not very clearly represented. So the workflows that have been designed, you know, 10 years ago, that we were warming ourselves towards a print-led delivery environment, and many of the workflows are attuned to cater to the print requirements. And web is sort of like a byproduct. And, and from your perspective, what do you see as a solution to move towards a true, you know, innovative browser-based workflow where web will also have an equal, you know, uh, status as a print delivery and, and the real estate is on the web, you know, you don't need to really worry about the uh, print cost. You don't really need to worry about uh, the page numbers. So are, are we still, you know, um, looking at uh, print-led 
workflows or are there opportunities that would allow us to move and, and treat web delivery as an equal citizen? Uh, Ian, you could go on. Unless, uh, I mean, this is this is one area where I have very little expertise because I've never been involved in print production workflows, but I think of this in the perspective of the market and what the product produces. So are there things that your print product does for you as a business that you currently can't replicate with the web version of that product? And I think uh, our the fact that we're tied to print currently has more to do with our inability to shift some of those business models. So I think that's where the focus of our attention need, needs to be. And then if we have the business model shifting, these questions around the technologies, I think they really are secondary to that. So that's my current perspective. Fantastic thoughts. Christian? Um, yeah, I mean, some publishers actually um, have, have good reasons uh, to focus on print because uh, their products are print products. They have customers that value print. They want print. They don't want anything else and they're making money off it. So that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, and, but I agree with uh, Ian that um, it's of course a, a challenge. Um, I mean, the question is always like, do you make a push now and try to move this business model into the digital world? There's always a risk to that. You might alienate some customers. You might just waste money uh, on, on efforts that don't succeed. So it, it's, it's easy to say, let's sit back and do nothing and just bring in the revenue and that's fine. But then like a couple of years down the road, someone else might make the shift for you and then you have a much bigger problem. So. Um, and I mean, that's what's happening. So people are experimenting, are trying to, to make this push. And um, I think what's, what's in the way is certain, certainly um, the perception that you've invested so much in status quo, you don't want to throw it away. That's human nature. It's not always, it's not what you find in an econom economics 101 book, but it's, it's human nature. And um, you also um, probably have uh, perceptions about quality that might not align with what your customers actually value. Um, I mean, that's a widespread uh, issue in the publishing industry for sure. Um, and I think a good example is uh, if you look at mobile phones, so I don't know, 12, 13, 14, 15 years ago, um, the, the first smartphones that came out, they, they had like Blackberry or, or like physical keyboards attached to them. And I could never imagine like using a phone without a physical keyboard because I'm way too clumsy to type properly. And then basically nobody produced them anymore and I had to use one and it's perfectly fine now and from billions of others uh, too. And so that, that was never really questioned afterwards. And maybe um, that moment is still coming for some of the print-centric businesses. Some others like newspapers have already had that moment. So um, I think it's always a bit dangerous to say the publishing industry because there's so many segments. It's academic, newspapers, magazines, professional books, and so on and so forth. And they are on different schedules, I think. Thank you, Christian. Helen, your thoughts on that, please. I'm going to think here specifically about publishers that are using their print PDFs and putting them up on the web and doing not a lot else. I think it's going to be really hard to change that model. It's efficient. It's quite cheap. There's no big drivers for that to change. And I think the only way that's going to change is if librarians, users, customers come in and say, actually, that's not good enough anymore. We want something different. And I think actually until we get that, sort of push from the community, not a lot will change. From a product perspective, it's very easy to make the arguments to, to, to improve the user interfaces. But I think from a business perspective, much trickier until we get some push from the community. And that maybe if I can, can add to that, I think the strategic question is really, uh, what, what are you selling? Are you selling products? Are you selling content? Are you selling a service or services? And I think that's the question you need to answer as a business, and then the rest will follow. But at the moment, um, a lot of businesses are still selling 
containers. So that's. I think this also uh, relates to how um, the current generation is consuming content, you know, and, and five, five, five to seven years from now, the Gen Z that is uh, attached to the social media that would become the consumers as well as the researchers. And, and uh, so this sort of, you know, this chain sort of becomes inevitable in a way that their demand on uh, the web products and the web products to be more smarter and smarter and, and having an environment of connected data and sources is sort of inevitable. So as-, but, as there, there are there are report, reports coming out of instructors in, in the US now who are finding students who don't understand files or the file system and can't complete tasks because when they're doing modeling tasks with the engineering software or whatever, they don't understand that they need to save a thing to a file system because they don't know what a file system is mm -hmm. because all of their computing experience has been on mobile devices. And it's taken a while for these instructors to even understand that these people didn't understand those things because they're so intrinsic to our model of how information works, but it doesn't need to be that way. Yeah, I, I think the sentiments here are also attached to the user. The users are driving the market and the users are attached to the print-led requirements. And, and, and we see that that community is going to evolve constantly with, with, with new set of users coming in. Uh, Adam, what are your thoughts on the last uh, question in terms of what opportunities are before us, you know, uh, to, to move away into a true um, browser-based environment, giving first-class um, opportunity for the web product as well? Um, well, I think the interesting thing was when we talk about um, print, we, it sounds like we're talking about trees and wood, right? <laughs> uh, but actually, we're talking about PDF um, and, you know, the journal world, whether it sells paper or not, is involved in um, PDF production as are those that produce um, paper artifacts as part of their business model. They, they, you know, there's the same up to that point, it's the same, right? Um, so I would say that what's necessary is to work backwards because a lot of these um, organizations can't move, not because of demand, but because of the workflows are mired in um, processes that lead to that endpoint. And that's all, always been about, once again, XML um, and sort of a, a highly structured approach to the content and, and various tooling. Um, but there is a business advantage to going to HTML where you can produce um, PDF cheaper. And that's the, that's the real key. Um, and once you realize that, then you can work backwards and you can say, okay, well, if I can produce PDF cheaper, that's great. You know, there's a, there's a no brainer from a business point of view, but in order to do that, I have to sort of change the underlying uh, technical infrastructure, which is obviously a big cost that needs to be factored in, but I have to look at uh, the underlying technical structure. And, and, and if we go towards an HTML based workflow, because you can get the HTML PDF um, very easily, um, then uh, the question is, if you're at that point, what else can you do, right? Uh, once you've got HTML as your base file format, a whole lot of other options open up to you. And I think, you know, we're seeing frustration in the industry because, for example, in the textbook industry, you know, there's a real demand for an interactive content and question-based stuff. But you know, big publishers can't get there because their because their entire workflow is based on the premise of getting to PDF <laughs> um, from structured uh, XML. So. You know, if we were to untie that and we would start off with HTML, you already have a surface that allows you to, to build, for example, interactive content. Um, and I don't like the term interactive content, it's a bit fuzzy, much like you know, digital transformation, but anyway. Um, so I, you know, I think the whole point is, is to say, okay, well, on a business, there are good business reasons to um, undo the infrastructure that you have to get to PDF to work backwards to HTML. And from that point, and it will save you money and time. And then from that point, your options are, are vast. And I, I think once or, once people realize that, they not only um, reduce their overheads and increase their profit margin, but they have a lot more options available to explore in terms of what kind of content they can produce. Fantastic thoughts there. On, on that note, uh, Adam, uh, we understand that there is a possibility to reinvent the business model, keeping the Gen Z users in mind, and there are new possibilities of new web products that can come up, you know, with interactivity as the focus, and, and uh, there's a whole lot of socializing around the content, you know, that, that's still the 
industry is not uh, experimented or moved forward with. A uh, lot of socializing on content happens outside of the research content, and that's a big potential for us. So as, as, as publishers and the ecosystem, looking at uh, uh, improving and increasing the engagement with the user community. Uh, in, a, in a connected data world for tomorrow, you know, we, we spoke about how Gen Z will become the researchers of tomorrow. What opportunities are before us to increase the engagement, increase the user experience, and what do we envision as the future of book and, and uh, the future of a journal article five years from now? That, that's a pretty loaded question. <laughs> Who would want to go first? <laughs> article of the future, anybody? <laughs> yeah, it, it can be completely imaginative. I just want to remind that that the topic is reimagining publishing, so it can be completely <laughs> open and completely innovative. Well, I'm really uh, bad at just. I'm, you know, I'm really, really bad at predicting the future. I was a big fan of of Google Wave, if anyone remembers that. Um, so I can't, I'm very bad at predicting the future. Uh, but I give you a vision. I give you a vision for I think what what I think we should be able to do. But but I think we're extremely blocked on being able to get there. Um, so, an article or a container it contains assertions, and we're getting to the point where we can quite easily link to knowledge bases with with the information that's in that article. Give people definitions, cross link citations. That's all sort of taken for granted. But if we could cross link every assertion across the entire corpus, we could in principle begin to, to give context. So where someone makes a, a point about a data measurement or um, a probability likelihood on, on an experiment, we could in principle be able to start to show the reader every other instance across the entire literature of where that data point was mentioned and give hints on whether this particular point is an outlier, uh, an outlier or in line with, with with the expected understanding of, of what's going on. And there's a whole field around computational knowledge, which is beginning to do this. Interestingly, the, the first earliest advances on that tried to work with the journal literature, but it was so poorly structured that they had little success. And instead have been working instead on, on data that's coming out of seismic instruments and working on the raw data rather than on the published literature. But that's a vision that a connected world, a world of digital first information could allow us to create which would significantly enhance the research process and our understanding of knowledge. However, it requires a platform, a common platform, the ability to connect all of these resources. And we have 35,000 publishers. I don't know how many tens of thousands of journals. It's incredibly difficult to imagine how we go from here to there, but it is something we might imagine moving towards. Uh, I think it's worth trying to set our ambition towards something like that. That's a that's a, a really remarkable vision, Ian. Adam, would, would you like to paint your vision? Uh, well, just riffing on what Ian says, I think you know the secret to that kind of interconnected, interconnected sort of uh, data universe is open access publishing. Don't think it needs to be. You know, you can't you can't connect that stuff if it's all behind paywalls. <laughs> you know, and you're not allowed to. Often, you know, there's big fights on this domain. Um, so I'd say the content has to be out there. And then, I, then actually, I think I, I would slightly disagree with Ian. I don't think we need to, um, I don't think we need to structure that content in a common way. I think Google has proven that, right? We can have intelligent um, search mechanisms that can understand um, documents and uh, whether you want to call it machine learning or AI, I, I dislike the term AI, but I think it's much overused and over, you know, in this world. The sector so you know you, you can sort of then um, uh, computationally process and associate uh, entities i think that's the secret i think relying too much on the humans is just just a, a total disaster <laughs> um uh, and you know who's got the time right so um so that's one part of it the other part of it is i think you know, i think you know to move if we think about the, the article or you know itself if we're talking about scientific publishing you know, this is moving forward in really interesting ways. Um, and, you know, we're seeing more and more sort of micro publication concepts and, you know, um, the, the value of publishing negative results and this kind of stuff. And I think it still has a lot of value. There's also the interconnectedness of, 
um, of articles and reproducibility questions that are starting to there's starting to be strategies. But all of this is very like sort of almost like we had the vision 15, 20 years ago, whenever, and it's just starting to incrementally move forward. Um, but it is making some progress. So the future for me is just more incremental movements forward. I don't think we'll see a massive revolution where suddenly the article is transformed into a different type of thing. It's, it's going to be a lot of small experiments that will move you know, the state of the sharing of information forward bit by bit. And, and, and interestingly, COVID has pushed that forward in the preprint domain and changed a lot of processes. So I think you know, there are some for, forcing mechanisms that, that can sort of push this along. But you know, if you're take, talking to five years in the future, I think we're going to be where we are now, but just a little bit different. I don't think it's going to be any massive revolution. Yeah. yeah. Small incremental changes for sustained goal. Yeah, so that's the key. I think we are close to the hour mark and, and uh, we can go to the Q&A from the audience. And I also believe that Clive has some questions as well. So, uh, so if there are questions from the audience, Clive, would you like to go on? You're muted. John, John, you're on mute, Clive, yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, fantastic conversation so far. Yes, we have some questions. Um, one from the audience earlier, which Christian has, uh, has already answered. So I'll take you through that. I'd be interested to put it to the other panelists. It's a big, big question. What should be the preparedness to embrace digital transformation on part of the publisher and vendor partners? Christian has answered that. Learn from other industries, engage and collaborate where possible with others. Stop reinventing the wheel, keep your processes as lean as possible and declutter them regularly. Realize that you need to have the right people and culture in your company. I think that's a fantastic answer to a difficult question. Gayathri, do you want to invite anyone else to throw uh, something in on that one? Of course, Helen. Helen, please. I don't think I can add anything to that. That's a fantastic answer. Yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gayathri, do you want to go with anyone else or shall I move? We just had another question landed okay. and I've got some others. I've got, I've got an yeah. answer. I think you need to be willing to invest at least £200,000 a year on it, minimum. You want to have three to four people with about 80% of their time dedicated to looking at that question and not just thin slice it across the existing resource inside the organization. And if you can't think that you can invest at least at that level, then you have to answer serious questions about your strategy. Yeah. And maybe to add to that, I mean, the actual figure, I don't really know about it, but at least knowing that you have to do R and D, call it what you whatever you want, innovation budget doesn't matter. That you have to have this kind of money that you that you're willing to spend it. Um, like most, a lot of companies don't even ha have a dedicated R and D budget, and that's certainly different in other industries. Yeah, I would like to slightly disagree with that. Uh if we're talking about innovation, innovation can happen anywhere and you can adopt the results and become part of the conversation. I mean, it's primarily why Cocoa exists, right? We, we innovate with a, a bringing people together and we've seen phenomenal results from that. Um, you know, um, some really substantial platforms evolve out of, out of that uh, process and uh, technologies. And so you don't actually have to spend any money at all to, be, to benefit from that. Uh, you can pick up these tools and move forward with them and they're not just like use our platform there are small pieces there are plenty of people do the small pieces of the tooling that you can then ingest into your own workflows you know talking about pdf creation etc so you know i don't think uh, innovation has to happen inside it can happen outside and you can reach out to it and then work out which pa um, parts make sense but also coming back to the vendor thing I think one of the most interesting steps forward for you know working with vendors and talking about innovation is to start thinking about vendors as being part of a team, your team, rather than throwing stuff over the wall and they're over there and they throw it back. You know, like actually bringing them into your team and, and, and working through, you know, how how the same uh, technology, the same platforms, how you can work together, how and that would in, in itself move towards more concurrency and transparency in the whole operation. Which can only be beneficial. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree with Adam on that slightly. Slightly. So I'll just put some nuance on that. One of the plagues that we have in our in our current work world is work is like a gas. It expands to consume all of the time that you give to it. And to be able to take innovations that might be happening in the landscape or in the ecosystem around you, 
you have to work hard to create slack inside your organization and the time to allow people inside the organization to make improvements on their processes. And that requires an understanding of, of the profile of your resourcing internally inside of an organization. And so my first answer was sort of a forced mechanism to make that space. There might be other strategies to do it, but you have to find a way to make space in the organization. Otherwise there's no capacity to take on board the things that are happening around you. Uh, and this you're forced to because you you know your workflow is really broken and it's costing you too much money right so you know and um and that's also can drive you towards innovation because you have no choice and you just have to make it work yeah. in the interest of uh, time there's another question from the audience uh, yeah we've got, a, we've got two actually i'll just quickly assuming i publish both print and digital data how should i differentiate I don't want to end up where both compete with each other. So what should I add in my digital component? Christian's writing an answer to that one as well, but Gayatri, no, I, stopped, I stopped writing. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's too difficult. Um, That's um, a pretty interesting question. Yes, go on, Christian. But I, I mean, I'd say I, the first question you need to answer is like, like what's what's the most important like what are you selling and if you if you say you're selling both then um my my assumption would be that digital probably has more growth potential than print that's just an assumption but it's probably true and in that case if so if you focus on on digital native content and for example use a, uh, html as the the basic format for that so you don't have to transform again and again when publishing, outputting it. Um, then the question would be, what would you lose if you produce print from, from this base format? And um, I think that's the question. So if, if, the, if, if you end up with an answer that, that tells you, well, you might have to give up, like, give up like a few bells and whistles in terms of formatting it, but it's not too bad, then that's probably a good choice. Um, if you have and I know some publishers have very specific requirements in terms of print that are dictated by their customers, then you might actually have to run to different processes. That might also be an answer. And then you can switch off the print process whenever that is no longer financially viable. I think there is also another sort of interesting possibility of differentiating web. Um, the true uh, spirit of the web has not been fully explored uh, in, in the content uh, while, while we are disseminating the content. We could always uh, uh, differentiate the web content via um, additional hooks or, or additional um, interactivity that we could uh, provide there, which allows the possibility for someone to have a virtual conference around the document, someone to also have a lot of socializing around the component, and, and we could have virtual conferences right just drawn the content itself so th there are numerous opportunities and possibilities that are there and and um, that that can potentially become a differentiator for for dialogue to be for the content to become more social i mean i mean this this question encapsulates the innovator's dilemma and so it, ideally you would want to cannibalize your own products but companies often find that very painful to do and they get wiped out by someone else who's willing to go in with a different business model and they they take out their their uh, legacy um business model so just be careful there's another interesting question it's a great question does the hesitancy toward digital transformation in publishing have a geographic component yes and no uh, yeah. <laughs> i would say uh this is probably what you can narrow it down to. That, that, that's a difficult one to, I don't know whether it's a geographic component. Helen, do you have an answer to that? No, I, I was gonna say I'm pretty pretty embedded in the Western, Western ways of thinking. So not, not got a lot of experience outside of that geographic region. My guess is probably. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I would assume, I mean, purely looking at also like Western hemisphere background, I would say that like Germany and, and other EU countries, they were really behind the curve for many years. Um, so like, if you look back like 15 years ago, there was like, uh, especially US companies that, that were 
that were experimenting more, but that has changed in the last five, six years. So I wouldn't, I can't really say that it's geographically distributed, at least not in the countries I'm familiar with. It comes down to people and, and company culture. And we've seen a lot of leadership changes in very traditional publishing houses. So the old um, stereotypes are probably not that true anymore, hopefully. We're seeing, we're, we're, seeing a, we're seeing the pandemic having led to uh, an increase in growth of digital adoption in India when we work in that market. Um, but that's really the only data point I, I can think of that's relevant to the question. Which begs the question about the pandemic, but we are very close on time. <laughs> um, are you okay, Catherine? Uh, can I just report back on the polls, just for the record? Absolutely. Um, we, we, um, the publishing ecosystem, overarching principles, uh, should that be supported? 96 to 4, I think that's a pretty overwhelming support of the kind of conversations that we've been having this afternoon. Uh, the HTML one is more split around the 62-38, 62 in favour, 38 not. So um, that's interesting in itself, I think. Um, very mindful of time. Thank you all for attending. Thanks ever so much, panellists. Uh, a recording of this will be available at contactlive.com um, very, very soon. Uh, big thanks to the panellists, huge thanks to Gayatri, and, of course, to Amnet for sponsoring this event and making it all possible. That's goodbye from me. I'm gonna hand over to Gayatri for a few closing words. Thank you, Clark. It's really been great listening to our wonderful panelists this evening and, 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 and a wonderful audience with interesting questions. Thank you so much for your participation. Of course, the evening spent with curious minds and innovative thinkers is always a great one. The session has certainly instilled some great thoughts in all of our minds, and I hope all of you greatly benefited from this. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to contact us. This is Gayatri, thanking you all and signing off on behalf of everyone at Amnet. Have a good evening. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Thank you.